What's interesting about this book, though, is that George H.W. Bush didn't decide to write his own big biography. Right. And you and he worked on it together. And, and tell us, first of all, how that all yeah. came to be. It, it came to be mainly because I met him. Uh, this was 1998. Uh, I went to Walker's Point with our friend, mutual friend, Michael Beschloss, the great historian. Um, we were there to do a feature on the book that President Bush did do with General Scowcroft about the end of the Cold War and his foreign policy. And I was immediately struck by the quiet, persistent charisma of George H.W. Bush. I had been an undergraduate through most of his presidency. Uh, my best friend in college was a man you may know named Jack Daniels. And so I was a little fuzzy on a lot of what yeah, had happened. Understood. I thought the Gulf War involved Destin. It's <laughs> um, hard to believe, actually, <laughs> that you weren't, you, you weren't like a long-time history nut. You but, know, I, you know, I had this Dana Carvey view of, of President Bush. And I asked Dana once, how do you do it, George, w., uh, George H. W. Bush? And he said, it's Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. But almost instantly on Medium, I understood why Americans across several generations had entrusted their fates to his hands. He gave off a kind of ineffable sense of command, of competence. Uh, and he came from a world where duty and service were not gauzy or nostalgic uh, talking points, but were the ambient reality. And so as we went, as we got to know each other, uh, at a certain point, uh, I asked what what might be in the vault, which is always what biographers ask, you know, what don't we know? And he said, well, I have a diary, would you like to read it? And I said, well, yes, Mr. President, I'm free, <laughs> you know. And it's an amazing document. Uh, it's uh, an audio diary. He dictated once, twice, three times a week during his presidency. Uh, you can sometimes hear the blades of Marine One, the engines of Air Force One. You can hear him slurping his coffee. You can hear the martini occasionally. Wow. Sometimes he's just beaten down. Sometimes he's exhilarated. And it's a very honest account of what it's like to be president in what he uh, Henry Kissinger called the most tumultuous four-year period uh, since Truman. Yeah. And Why was that? This. Why do you think that, I mean? Well, it starts it with Tiananmen Square, uh, it go which raises long-term questions about our dealings with Asia and China. Uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, which began under Ronald Reagan, but which was managed brilliantly by George H.W. Bush and Jim Baker and Brent Scowcroft. And the domestic world that unfolded was one in which it was a real test to see whether a Republican president was going to try to govern for the good of the overall country or deal only with his base. And George H.W. Bush's answer was that he was going to do what was good for the country. He had made a promise not to raise taxes. He believed as the years went on that was not the right thing to do. He knew he would pay a political price. As he put it, as only he can, he knew that he would be dead meat uh, if he broke that pledge. He broke it and he was. That's what led Pat Buchanan in. That's what helped lead Ross Perot in to 1992. And I just think you had this remarkable uh, confluence of events. You also had in him the last great president who was able to produce bipartisan big pieces of legislation. The Americans with Disabilities Act. Every building in the United States of America has George Bush's thumbprint on it. Um, I was, l last night I was at an event and a young man with special needs came up to me and said, George Bush changed my life because I now have equal rights at every sphere of life. And it sort of breaks your heart because you would not think of this man uh, who's seen more as a Gulf War president and kind of a, still kind of a distant wasp who does interesting, he does quirky things like jumping out of airplanes. But he was a serious minded man. He gave his life to the country. I'd argue that journey began on June 12th, 1942. He turns 18, he graduates from Andover and he joins the United States Navy. On the 2nd of September, 1944, he's shot down over the Pacific. He loses two of his crewmates. At some point today in Maine, where he is, they're in Maine for another couple of weeks before they go back to Texas, he will think about Del Delaney and Ted White, the two men he lost. Yeah. And I ask him, I say, what do you think about that? It's one of the many moments where he cried 
Um, He's an emotional man. Very emotional. Man. Our interviews were sometimes like the world's worst wasp on wasp therapy. You know, he would cry, I would cry, uh, and then we'd change the subject. There was a mutual respect between you. You can, I mean, this is a this is a, a favorable biography. Sure. You didn't go out to um, necessarily go at it from a hardcore critique element. It, no, it, because it, I don't think I don't think the facts lead to that. Um, I think he tried to do the best he could. Um, one of my theories of biography, uh, to be very simple, simplistic about it, is from Friday Night Lights. I'm a Southerner. Um, and the motto of that football team in the fictional uh, Friday Night Lights is clear eyes, full heart. I think biographers should have clear eyes and full hearts mm -hmm. because in this case in particular, it's a man who wasn't in it for the money. Uh, he wanted to serve. He wanted power. The p title of the book includes the word power. He was driven to do it from a very early age. In Mrs. Bush's diary, which she let me read, um, which much to Bush 43's uh, consternation, when Bush 43 found out that his mother had given me her diary, uh -oh. he said, <laughs> that's not going to work out for me. <laughs> uh, but It's it, not a bad g do <laughs> I've spent a lot there. of time with these people. Uh, 1965, she writes that she thinks that George wants to be president, and he tells a possible primary opponent in a house race in the 7th District of Houston, mm -hmm. Texas, that he wants to be president. Mm -hmm. So he had, his, he had his eye on this prize for a long time. He's not a perfect man. His sins are in here. Iran-Contra is in here. His failure to support the 1964 Civil Rights Act. His failure to capitalize on the Gulf War victory to engage a changing America in the early 1990s is in here. He ran, as Tip O'Neill put it, the worst campaign for re-election anyone could remember. But he did it in part because he was a man out of time. Three things happened in 1992 that I think have shaped where we are today with Trump and Hillary Clinton. One was the rise of reflexive partisanship, the idea that a Newt Gingrich would side with the party over the president. Um, the rise of cable TV and alternative media. Uh, it's impossible to imagine Ross Perot without Larry King, right? So like Trump, he went around the traditional media. And in Bill Clinton's case, it was the rise of confessional politics. Bill Clinton told us that he felt our pain. George Bush did too. He just didn't believe it was the president's job to show it. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I like to say is Bill Clinton went on Arsenio Hall. To George Bush, Arsenio Hall was probably a building at Andover. You know, he just had no idea. Yeah. It wasn't his world. Well, things had changed, to your point. One of the things, I mean, imagine the, uh, when I read this, one of the things that shocked me is that thinking back, the Cold War consumed America for all those years, and then he years. gets a call from, from Gorbachev announcing that Christmas Day, 1991. And that the Soviet yeah. Union is dissolving. You would think that would be enough to get him reelected, in, uh, given the, the role of the Cold War in American history, but he was a one-term president. The political, one of the things about American life is the political marketplace has a very short memory, and it discounts bad things that don't happen. Politicians get very little credit for preventing bad things. Yeah. And part of Bush's reality, he used to say it to his staff all the time, let's just make sure we don't make things worse. Yeah. And that's actually, not to get too, too dorky here, that's actually classic Burkean conservatism. Ronald Reagan was not a conservative in the sense we think. Reagan was a revolutionary. He wanted to lead a counter-revolution to FDR and the New Deal. George Bush was a Tory conservative. He was a Burkean conservative who accepts reality as he finds it and attempts modest reform because the lesson of history is that modest reform works better than radical reform. Yeah, he, he seems very aware of the, the legacy question. Uh, he, there's a part in the book where he talks to you about the fact that he knows that he's, he's caught between yeah. the sort of the largesse of, of Ronald Reagan and, and the, the buildings named after him and everything yeah. and then the sort of the drama of, of the, the drama of his sons um, yeah. and that he's in the middle of that and somewhere he feels maybe lost in that. He said, it was, and I cannot imagine another president. I've been lucky enough in what I do to, I've spent time with President Ford, President Carter, Mrs. Reagan, President Bush, President Bush, President Clinton, Secretary Clinton, President Obama. 
So everybody except Reagan and Nixon of my lifetime. I cannot imagine another president saying, as you allude to, I feel like an asterisk. Most former presidents, when you talk to them, you'll say, what a beautiful day. They will say, you know, the weather when I was president was really great. You know, they have an ability to bring it back to right. their presidency. You have to take a squash racket and beat George H.W. Bush about the head to get him to acknowledge that he was ever president. Yeah. It's just a different kind of uh, code. I'd argue, at the risk of overstatement, that he actually has culturally and temperamentally more in common with the founding fathers than he does with his own generation mm. now. It's quite a statement. Yeah. Uh, the other element is when you think about George W. Bush, and we don't have a lot of time, but that legacy is an important part. And, and a lot of those people on his team, Cheney for one, his opinions changed so dramatically about Cheney. And, and some of the things he, that George H.W. Yeah. said about Cheney surprised both Cheney and George W. w. Yeah. That was a fascinating part of the book. When you showed what, Ch what, yeah. what his father had said about him, they both were sort of surprised. Yeah. You know, maybe even yeah. stunned is the word. I felt like an underpaid family therapist. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, Interesting I, I, is what Cheney said. And fascinating. George was like, hmm. fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> um, he was very honest. I mean, the, the president was, he made these comments to me over several years, but beginning in 2008, when he began to, and this book was definitely going to be way in the future, uh, he said that he thought that Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld had not served the president well, um, that they had been too hawkish, uh, that they had not appreciated the role of diplomacy. Uh, he held his own son to account for having rhetoric that was often too hot. Um, he made none of these comments to anyone in real time that I can find. He'd not said it to Cheney. He'd not said it to Bush 43. And um, I went back several times. I r made sure the president, that I had quoted him accurately. Yeah. Uh, I took Quite it to everyone. Quite a revelation. Everyone. I took it to everyone. But it shouldn't be surprising ultimately. I mean, basically what George Bush 41 believed was that force and diplomacy had to be complementary. An interesting thing, and this tells us something about the Bush code, because 41 and 43 didn't talk about substantive matters very much, at least that I've ever found any evidence of. But what's interesting and ironic and somewhat sad is that they actually ended up closer to one another toward the end of W's second term. W ended up in a more moderate place. And that's a place where his father had always been. Yeah. And you wonder if they had talked, what might have happened. Right. Well, it's a fascinating story. So much more to be told. No, thank you. Including the fact that no, you know, read my lips was enough to take down sort of perhaps that, that, that re-election campaign. And you've got so much more being said in the campaign elections now, which don't seem to have the same effect uh, on these candidates. At oh, all. In, that is that's a great point. I mean, the, the idea that one soundbite would sink a presidency yeah. when we have a Republican nominee now who everything he says should sink it. Yeah, um, times have changed. I will say this quickly. Um, I do think the movement in 25 years from George H.W. Bush as the Republican nominee to Donald Trump disproves Darwin. So I think that that's an important thing to bear in mind. Well, we'll leave it at that. Uh, John Meacham, thanks so much for thanks. being here today here on the Thank PBS you. set. It's great to have you. The Appreciate book is it. The American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush, Destiny and Power. Thanks very much. Thanks.